Good morning, Fellowship of Faith. Hello, I'm, everyone. I'm Tina Gadini. I'm Ben Gadini. My son. Yes, not Justin, but I'm a regular at this point. <laughs> so, Ben, you might recognize him. He also plays the guitar, the worship it's true. team. It's true. Rhythmic guitar. Rhythm guitar. Rhythm guitar? Rhythm, not rhythmic. <laughs> no ICs here. Rhythm. Yes. Guitar. So anyway, we want to welcome you to Fellowship of Faith. We're glad you're with us. Yes, we're excited you're here. Um, looking forward to a, so I hear, controversial sermon. You guys, I'm excited for this one. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen anything, but I've I heard have. I've heard that it's kind of ballsy. But isn't Jesus ballsy? So like, <laughs> yeah. I don't think Jesus. Controversial. I don't know if Jesus has ever been called that. Oh, I think he's definitely ballsy. <laughs> the amount of controversy he started. Controversial. Which is ballsy. <laughs> to, I, mean, I mean, yeah, he did he, he did some pretty crazy things. I, I'm going with it. Jesus is now ballsy in my mind. <laughs> oh my I don't even I don't even know where to go now. <laughs> I I don't either. <laughs> So anyway, anyways, anyway. Uh, this so Wednesday... Today, no, no, no. <laughs> no? So today's okay. message actually is very interesting. And I'm like, oh, you guys, everybody has to come to this and, and, and like hear it because it's basically the, the woman about the passage about women should be silent oh, in church. Yeah, that'll right? be... <laughs> that's gonna... Okay. And so I'm like, everybody should come because it's not what you think it is. Mm-hmm. And then I'm talking to, da- to Dad, Dave, Pastor Dave, my husband, over like the, the week and he's explaining what the passage is actually about and it's not what I thought it was about. Yeah. Well, it's like, Paul gets such a bad rap as well for being anti-woman, Mm because, like, in Timothy, we see a lot of stuff, and And Corinthians, but, like, if anything, Paul would probably be one of the biggest supporters of women in the church, and so it's just the ways that his words get misinterpreted and taken out of context. Context. Context is huge. It's it's true. And not just, like, literary context, but historical context as well, of the whole, if you're being lured by a woman because we compare <gasps> Yay, thank you. Uh, we compare Corinth to Vegas for example if you know the prostitutes are taking away from God yeah Paul's going to call them out but that's a very specific thing I don't know I might be so jumping anyway, ahead but that's just to say I'm looking forward to what's going to happen today yes. we got great music today too okay very exciting um, um, this week this past week was a Wednesday night mm-hmm. um, Dr. Doss came and did that talk yeah and I got to tell you guys You showed up, and I was so proud of you, Fellowship of Faith. There were, I I remember driving into the parking lot being like, holy cow, there's There's no place to park. Yeah, it was incredible. Because we've had things like that here before, and like not a whole lot of people showed up, but it's a little bit embarrassing. Yeah, but. You guys showed up. It it was was, so exciting. Yeah. And Dr. Doss was phenomenal. Yeah, he did an incredible job. I mean, it's talking about interpretation of the scripture or yeah, translation like functionality versus formality I, I mean, and sounds like boring stuff it was but not he, it he was, was he's passionate about it and great able to public just, speaker yeah it was a lot of fun and i wanted to give i was i was inter- being introduced to his family because they brought mm-hmm. a whole crew i'm thinking they brought like 25 30 people and dad says no it's like 10 oh okay. like but i think i'm closer to being right because they brought a huge Okay, I only ever met his family, so that's all I knew. There's a whole group of people. Because he's not a pastor. He's a teacher. Well, he is a reverend doctor, so he he is a pastor. But he's not a pastor at at the church he goes to. Oh, okay. And so they've never heard him speak. Interesting. So his church then came out to hear him speak. Interesting. Um, Hmm. But anyway, so I was being introduced to his family, his Mm -hmm. wife and his kids, and um, Tom... You came up behind me, and, and I kind of, like, smiled. And I was going to say hello, and I didn't get a chance to. So, Tom, I'm so glad that you came out Wednesday, and I hope you enjoyed it, too. Yes. <laughs> um, I know, at least for uh, staying on the Wednesday thing, he's definitely sold me on the uh, CSB, Christian the Standard CSB Bible. The CSB version of the Bible. It's on, um, the, on the app, if you have the Life app. New version. New version, thank you. Yeah, I have a couple of friends that have been reading it this year that rave about it. So, mm-hmm. I'm excited to start diving into it, seeing what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. And I also want to give a shout out to Pastor Jerome from Uganda, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who is out visiting with Stephen Barbie. Um, connections with the Hope Center out there. Yep. I know you're hopefully online watching because. Hopefully. <laughs> if not, oh well. Oh well. Anyway, Pastor Jerome, we're glad you're with us. Yes. Um, yes. Enjoyed you being on the podcast on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. All right. We're going to get ready to worship. You guys hope you have a good one, and we'll see yes. you at the Looking backside. forward to worshiping with you.
Let's stand and sing.
My name is David Gadini, pastor here at Fellowship of Faith. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this. And, and our prayer and our hope is that you meet God here today, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hey, mad shout out to our dance party down here. Rock on. All right. I wish you guys could see it. I mean, I swear, I want to get a camera down here so you can put it on the screen. You talk about the joy of the Lord. There's these girls that dance up here every week. And, uh, and I know that has a wrong connotation when I say it out loud, but, but these little girls who are just like filled with joy dancing away. Way and I uh, love it, guys. All right. Hey, um, do us a favor. Make a base touch with us this morning. Text the word here to this number, 855-465-2720. 855-465-2720. Please, especially if you're new with us here at Fellowship of Faith, do this. Sometimes this is the only way that we know that you worship with us and uh, you matter. And we're glad that you're here. And I would love to reach out to you this week if you do that, just to say, hello, thanks for coming. Pray for you and uh, field any questions that you might have on this church or more importantly about God and, and your, your life and your walk and your journey with him. Likewise, if we can be praying for you in some specific way, text the word prayer to the same number, 855-465-2720. And our elders will get that and be praying along you this coming Sunday. Hey, before I get into the weeds any deeper here this morning, I got a couple of shout outs that I want to make. Two of our graduating seniors, our two Boulder seniors are graduating. One yesterday, one today at one o'clock. Big shout out to Carly Bodinas and a big shout out to Ben Gadini. All right. Carly graduated yesterday. My son is graduating at 1 p.m. today. So if I don't stick around to talk after church today, I am not blowing you off. Just save your time next week and I'll, I'll grab you then, all right? Another mad shout out though to Chris Stanick, our keyboard player, because she is retiring from teaching and has two days left to go. Let's give it up for her. So let me give a shout out now on next Sunday, just so it doesn't catch you unaware, and a little preview into what's coming our way this summer. Next Sunday is Memorial Day weekend. We are not doing a nine o'clock discipleship hour next Sunday. 10 a.m. worship, of course, but no 9 a.m. discipleship hour, be it for the Rock, for Boulder, or for the adult class that we have. However, we do meet in this capacity all summer long. So on Sunday, June 5th, two Sundays from today, the nine o'clock hour resumes. It is a big Sunday. It is Pentecost. You are not going to want to miss that. It's going to be great. And uh, make sure to mark that and, and come back into the nine o'clock stream at that point. Well, we are finishing up 1 Corinthians chapter 14 today. And some good, controversial, exciting, um, possibly infuriating, and an interesting kind of stuff. But let's jump to the video and then we'll get going here. Now here at Fellowship of Faith, in part reflected in that video, and certainly bleeding out the pores of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 12 to 15 on a hyperdrive, is the idea that when we gather in this kind of capacity, we are meant to be here as more than isolated, autonomous individuals, but instead doing life together. It's, it's, it's a base touch, a family reunion, community, fellowship marked by 
peace together and joy and mutual edification and encouragement and all the good stuff that should happen when community is gathering at its best. Now, we got a practice here at Fellowship of Faith that we used to do a whole heck of a lot before COVID. We kind of got away from it after then, but we kind of flirt with it a little bit today, and it's where we kind of get up and say hi to each other, and it's called sharing the peace, if you will, and we're actually going to do it today. I want you to take a few moments to share the peace with you, because the idea behind it is let's not be strangers in a room. Let's be gathered here, acknowledging, identifying, and encouraging those who sit around us and meeting each other, especially if we don't know them, but I want to do it biblical style today, all right? And here it is. It's a verse that's always fascinated me. (laughs) So take a couple moments, greet someone with a holy kiss, and let's get going. We'll come back in 30, all right? All right, let me pull you in. Let me pull you in. (laughs) Thought about getting a big Vandalia onion and just biting deep and uh, coming in. Here's my question for today, all right? Why didn't you do it? She did it. Okay, we have, we have a winner, all right? And, and suddenly next week, everyone sits on this side of the church. But I'll tell you, from my, from my vantage point, I didn't, I didn't see anyone do it. Did, did anyone else see anyone, like, do it? No? Okay, so, so we, got a, we, we got a brother who kissed his wife. All right, all right, way to play the loophole there, sir, you know? Now, I can say personally, I came up to three guys right down here, and I mean, I I was ready. I mean, it was, and like, this woman over here, she wouldn't make eye contact with me, you know, it, back to the question, why didn't you do it? Okay, it's not appropriate, what else? Because you're too Lutheran, yes, and, and the, And and the very fact that you spoke out loud is indicative that you are actually not that Lutheran because I think I heard over here, maybe it echoed, someone just go, because, ew, right? And some of you want to play the loopholes, define holy, right? So I'm not going to do it at all because I don't want to risk doing it incorrectly and being unholy. I'm so sure. I am so sure, right? It's clear as day. It's like six words. Seven, I can count. Greet one another with a whole, yeah, seven words, all right. It's matter of fact. It's straightforward. So why don't you do it? I can, I can push it further. Paul even says, no, no, this isn't even like put in here. I wrote this with my own hand. You know, no, no debating this. And if you don't love the Lord, arguably maybe even in that way, let that person be cursed. Why didn't you do it? If I was to, do, if I was to say, let's do it again, would you go, oh, well, now I see the light. You know, oh, it's, it's all clear to me now. Let's... Oh, Bring it on, baby. You know, I mean, no, no, we wouldn't do it. And of course, we know why we don't do it. Because we look at a verse like that, and it's just weird. It's off-putting. It's uncomfortable. And we can start analyzing it, going, maybe there's a loophole. Maybe I can get out of doing something I want to do. Or maybe more instinctually and intuitive, we understand something else. Maybe instinctually and intuitively, 
We look at a passage like that and we just kind of understand that there is a principle being expressed here, even if the letter of the law, if I can put it that way, doesn't need to be followed. And that what Paul is mandating here is not that you better kiss the people around you otherwise, but instead indicating maybe a sense of, I want you to affirm each other and embrace each other and enjoy each other and greet each other and show affection to each other and love each other. And he just so happened to describe it with a cultural convention of a day with a kiss. Maybe. Or, more likely, maybe we just look around a room when something like that comes our way, and we'll see anyone else doing it, so I ain't doing it either. Now, keep all that in mind, okay? Keep all that in mind as I share another strange passage with you today. We've come to the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's about life together. It's about life together as what Paul will call the very body of Christ, a way of living together in an interconnected, mutually dependent, mutually edifying and encouraging kind of way. And there is going to be a similar passage in here that I think might also be weird or strange or off-putting or offensive. Keep all what we've just talked about in mind as I read you this passage today from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Follow along if you'd like or just listen. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation a tongue, or an interpretation. Each of us has something to say, in other words. Each of us has something to bring. Each of us has a way that God is working in us that has value to the coming together. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or three at the most should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Now, as in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. No matter what I just read, I am quite sure that you fixated on one little passage. <laughs> so let's talk about that <laughs> because we're not going to be able to get any further until I think we come to some resolution here.
I can just say I'm thoroughly enjoying this moment right now. I, I truly, I think, have never had a more captive audience. Like, I saw people actually, like, lean forward. Like, like are, are, is this going to be like someone was saying earlier, is this going to be like the Blues Brothers where they're throwing the beer bottles and I got to be behind the kit, you know? Let's talk about it, though. Let's talk about what is going on here. First, the driving purpose cannot be to explain it away. The driving purpose of any passage of Scripture cannot be to explain it away. We believe the Bible is God's word, that it is God's message to us, and that if it's in there, it has something very important to say at all times to all people in all places. And if our motivation, whenever we come to the Bible, is simply to try to get around something that we don't like or makes us feel uncomfortable or challenges our beliefs or our values or our ways of the way we think things should be in the world, if our goal, in other words, is to simply go, how can I dismiss this, ignore this, get around this, or undermine this? we at best risk being disrespectful to God by denying what he actually wants to tell us and at worst, find ourselves in very dangerous country. So what that means is that if the Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss, We need to at least begin the conversation by positioning ourselves in such a way of going, I need to be willing to do this. Because maybe, just maybe, God knows something that I don't know, and even though I don't understand this, I need to be willing to trust God and do it anyway, trusting that he is good and that there is a purpose here that while I might be blind to, makes it worth following the command anyway. And so likewise, we have to begin the discussion by simply saying, Lord, I need to be willing to trust you at some base level that if you say I need to be silent, even if I don't understand it, even if it's off-putting to me, even if I don't like it, I need to trust you more than I trust myself. Because if we don't begin the discussion there, we find ourselves on very dangerous ground. The goal has to be, what is God communicating to me? What does God want me to understand about himself, about myself, about life together, about how to honor him, to give my life for him, to to be obedient to him? Anything short of that misses the point already. Second, Whenever you come across a passage like this, or like greet one another with a holy kiss, or any other number of passages that just don't seem to make sense, that seem to be kind of out of sorts, you know, if you will, what I find is a very important exercise to do is to ask the text questions. Enter into dialogue with it. Let me just read to you a few that I wrote down when I was looking at it. Is this binding on all women at all times? Or just Corinth? Or just that era? Is there a theological reason behind this? Or is it merely a practical one? Do I need to follow it to the letter? Or is there a principle here that's meant to be drawn out instead, similar to the way that Paul does with head coverings in 1 Corinthians 11, or greeting each other with the holy kiss in 1 Corinthians 16? 
Maybe this. All women? Or just wives? Because it seems to imply that they're supposed to ask their husbands at home. What if they don't have a husband? What if they're not married? And I can push it more into things like this. How come? Why silent? Well, the text answers some of this. It says, it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Disgraceful to who? Disgraceful why? Disgraceful because it was culturally disgraceful in its day for some reason, or because it's disgraceful to God? How about this? It says we're to do this earlier because God is a God not of disorder, but a God of peace. It's the verse right before. And so are we to understand that maybe there's some reason here that has to do with maintaining some kind of current peace? It says we're to do this because it's as the law says. What law? Because certainly the law is Paul, Jesus, and the Corinthian church would have understood it, meaning the Old Testament doesn't actually say that anywhere. Test me on it. See if you can find it. And so what law is it talking about? Synagogue law? Something else? Whenever you come across a tricky passage like this, something that doesn't seem to line up, switch from a passive reading mode and go full-on active and start having a conversation with the author. Start asking the text questions. Now, some will look at a passage like this and take it at face value. Women should be silent. Period. Here's the problem. Paul doesn't back that up, talk like that, or encourage that really in any other place except maybe one or possibly two. No, far more, you see the opposite. In 1 Corinthians 11, he assumes and encourages that women pray and prophesy. And understand that when they would pray, they would do it out loud. And Paul encourages it. We've already seen that Paul encourages people to use their gifts. He doesn't say half of you use your gifts. He says the entire body should use their gifts. Even the weakest or the most modest or the most downtrodden, if you will, among us in the cultural eye. He encourages that, no matter what the gift is, which I would argue would even include teaching, prophesying, administering, leading. We have certainly see Paul commend and command that women prayer, not just pray, but praise and worship, we see Paul acknowledge women who are leaders of house churches and reference them. We see Paul talk about women as fellow workers and embrace them in church authority roles. On one occasion in Romans chapter 16, it's arguable that he even calls a woman an apostle. Certainly a deaconess throughout and other things as well. Sometimes when Paul mentions these fellow workers that he is in the trenches with, and they are a married couple, it is interesting to me that he will at times mention the wife first. The place of prominence. A sense of more identification. Maybe a sense of more prominence, if you will, in the community. And on top of this, we can add other things where Paul will say things like, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus, women too. There is no difference, Jew or Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. 
I just don't think Paul has some kind of agenda to keep women minimized, downtrodden, or muted. And so a face value reading doesn't seem to do justice, does it, to the biblical witness. So what do we make of it? Well, we know it's qualified in some way. Here's some options. Woman and wife is the exact same work in Greek. Maybe it should read, wives should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but be in submission as the law says, which would certainly make sense of the next sentence. If they want to inquire about something, they should inquire of their husbands at homes. Maybe he's talking about husband and wife relation, not male and female relation. Or maybe it's like this. Kathy Keller, wife of Tim Keller. Identifying it along the lines of maybe 1 Timothy chapter 2. Equating what Paul is saying here to some authoritarian teaching role, if you will. Maybe. Maybe it's like Gilbert Belzecchian suggests. That it's actually a Corinthian quote. That Paul isn't giving his own opinion, but he's quoting what the, the, the Corinthian church is saying and then countering that with a theology of his own. First Corinthians is certainly loaded with examples like this. Now, culturally, in Paul's day, when they would gather together to worship, what is certainly understood is that when they would gather, men would sit on one side and women would sit on the other. Many churches today, believe it or not, Still practice that way. You'll see it among Coptic Christians. You'll see it in some Orthodox communities. You'll see it among the Amish and the Mennonites. Maybe there's some practical things going on here. And we're over-theologizing it. Maybe it's simply things like this. And I've seen these kinds of things happen firsthand. Men are sitting here. Women are sitting here. Where do the children sit? With the women. Of course. 99% of the time, it has always been the case and always will be until Christ comes again. (laughs) Women, because you're sitting over here, let me ask you, can you get anything done with small kids? Can you pay attention for more than that long with small kids? Can you pay attention for more than that long with large kids? Because the entire service is filled like this. Where's my Cheerios? Where's my candy? Can I play on your phone? I'm bored. What do I do? Oh my gosh, they're disrupting this person. Oh my gosh, they're disrupting this person. You spend the entire hour just fidgeting and fussing. And maybe they were shooting across to their husbands on the other side. Hey, I missed that. What did they say? Maybe it was something as practical as that. Or maybe they didn't understand the local dialect. Maybe they only spoke the local dialect and did not understand the Hebrew text in which the message was read, explained, and given. Maybe they did what we all do. Hey, what do you say? Hey, I don't get it. Hey, explain it to me. Maybe it was like this. Like a cell phone going off in church, they just want to chat back and forth, you know, and, 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 and little disruptions happen and go off. Maybe it was as simple as that. Maybe as their husbands were standing up to prophesy, they were bringing their family squabbles in, talking to each other, looking at each other. He's full of crap. <laughs> you should see what he's like at home. Oh, yeah, you're all excited by him. And maybe Paul is simply saying, don't bring it here. There are any number of possibilities of what it could be. And which of them it is, I don't know. But what I do know is this that there was some kind of issue that was a practical issue around women speaking when they gathered together in the body 
And that practical issue was symptomatic of a deeper issue. And it was that deeper issue that was disrupting the church. And it was to that that Paul was speaking. Let me give you an example of this. Sometimes I find it helps to retask a passage a little bit, to use a different example along the same lines, to see if it makes more sense. What if it read like this? <laughs> Children should not get up to go to the bathroom in churches. They are not allowed to keep getting up, but they must be considerate of others. As Jesus says, if they want to go to the bathroom, they should go before or after the service because it is disgraceful to keep getting up and disrupting everyone. Does it suddenly start to make more sense? Now, wouldn't it be ridiculous if Paul had written this to walk away with the conclusion, Paul is anti-kid. Paul just doesn't like children. Would it not be equally ridiculous to start theologizing on this point that somehow there is something wrong with going to the bathroom? That, some, that, 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 that there's something just violating to the holiness of God in relieving yourself? Would that not be stupid? Would it also not be ridiculous to look at a passage like this and to try to keep it absolutely, woodenly, rigidly, and literalistically? That there was never a time to go to the bathroom while gathered together in worship. Pee the seat. <laughs> Throw up where you sit. It fundamentally misses the point, doesn't it? And if we can put our emotions aside and step away from the hot topic button for a broader perspective of what Paul has to say, we might just discover the deeper issue going on of which this happened to be a symptom of in the Corinthian church or arguably any church today. What Paul, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are communicating here is not something anti-women. What they are not about is silencing you. What they are about is learning what it means and insisting on what it means that when we gather together to be considerate of others, and ensure that my purpose in being here is not about me, but about you. For Paul, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, church is not about asserting your rights. It is not about making a statement. It is not about coming with a mindset to see what I can get out of it, to have the best experience because of what's in it for me. Paul, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are a little concerned with that kind of attitude and speak very heavily against it. It is not about finding your voice, your place, your purpose, your pleasure, your preference, your proclivity. 
It's not about any of that. That is not the purpose of why we gather here on a Sunday morning. Whatever your own personal purpose might be. It's not what the Bible says our purpose should be. You know what the purpose is of coming together? It's simple. To worship God. I don't come to see what I get out of it. I come to give honor to him. I don't come to get glorified. I come to glorify him. I don't come to get filled up. I come to give filling to him. I don't come because I like it. I come because I like him. And the way that I fundamentally show and express that is not just through prayers and singings and songs and hymns. It's through how I treat the person sitting next to me. It's how I treat the person sitting across the aisle from me. It's how I conduct myself for their edification for their benefit. Even apart from my own. It's about practice for life outside of these four walls. Because if we cannot learn to be considerate among each other and put each other's needs before each other, to honor each other before ourselves and be sensitive towards what each other are struggling with in need, we will never be able to do it out among the pagans. We will never be ready to do it out there among those people where our salt and light truly matters. And if you can step back and see it through that lens and interpret it through those eyes, suddenly you see this entire passage exploding with that point. Follow along with me through the entire section of 1 Corinthians 14 that I read to you, but you forgot because you fixated here. And look at how he says it to more than just women. Open your Bibles and follow with me if you'd like. But let me just highlight a few for you. I'm going the wrong way on this button. First, he says, what shall we say? When you come together, each of you has a hymn, a word, an instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, each of you. Does that include men? Does each of you include women? Does each of you include children? Maybe on a good day. (laughs) But everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Not so that you're built up. So that the church, the body, is built up. Everything is through that lens. Look at what he says. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or three at most should speak, and one at a time, and someone should interpret. And if there isn't an interpreter, what? Keep quiet. Speak to yourself and to God. Do you realize how many people Paul is silencing right now? here. And is it just women? Why? Because what we do is not for me. It's for the body. He goes on and says this. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should shut up. Be quiet. For you can all prophesy in turn. And earlier he would say, including women. So that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. It's only then that he gives a third practical point. Women should also remain silent. Because it's not about you. And I include males too. Because fundamentally, the gathering of the body is not about you. And the way that you show consideration and respect and honor and betterment to each other 
is not by magically getting along and being unified on every preference and belief. It has never happened since the time of Jesus, and it will never happen until the day he comes. It is about submitting yourself to one another. It's about submitting yourself to one another and putting each other first. As Paul would say, when you gather in the body. Not me, before you. Like the Corinthians, I think we in the church really screw this up. I see this all the time. And it has nothing to do with gender. That the primary reason people come to this gathering is because they like it. And as soon as they stop liking it, they go somewhere else. What does that say about you? Oh, sure, sometimes there's a window. Sometimes there's a spectrum, if you will. But isn't it making the same fundamental error that the gathering is all about me? I see this happen all the time. Someone has a gift. And they find meaning in it and joy and fulfillment when they use it. But when the gift no longer benefits the body in the exact same way, they storm off. Because if it's not about my gift, if it's not about me, I'm going to go somewhere where people appreciate me. How do we screw this up? I see it happen all the time. Griping and bickering, dissenting and nitpicking. I didn't like that song. The sanctuary was too cold. They ran out of coffee. The kids were distracting me. On and on and on and on. Maybe what Paul is calling us to do is simply be silent. to stop being so concerned with me and give myself instead as a living sacrifice for the mutual edification and betterment of the body. And as Paul will say later, particularly, the unbelievers among us. And maybe, just maybe, when we start having the conversation and start entering the question that isn't led with what's in it for me, but instead, what can I give to God and how can I bless them? We come a step closer to understanding what in the heck Paul is talking about and how these words have a principle that echo into all places and all time for all believers perpetually. Maybe when we come to that place, we start understanding what the body's gathering is supposed to be about. And maybe when we come to that place, we start experiencing even more how God's spirit will work among us collectively because that's his promise in the body that the Holy Spirit, to be sure, comes to each of us individually. But in certain ways, he comes to us collectively. And when we learn the way of Jesus collectively, oh, what kind of worship will that give to God? And what will we witness the Spirit unleash? And if you can walk through these passages with that set of eyes, I hope that at that stage, what is confusing, unclear, off-putting, starts to be seen 
more deeply and clearly. That is Paul's hope for the Corinthian church. And it's God's hope for ours. Let's learn to master this. Male and female alike. So let's sing. Let's pray. Maybe prophesy. And if two or three of you at most have a tongue, let it loose. If there's an interpreter. And use your voice. Ladies. Because Paul and God want you to. Rise with me. Let's start with the prayer of confession. And then we'll sing in response to God. And while those are very good words, not that one. Just pray with me. God, we come before you quite arguably as a self-centered church. Quite arguably a self-centered people. It's our inclination, Lord, to always ask the question, what's in it for me? To strive after what I want, what I need, what fills or blesses me, Forgive us, God, if we come and gather with a wrong attitude and a wrong set of eyes. Forgive us, God, if we come with a perspective that is shifting the focus towards us from you. Lord, we come together today, arguably, as a gifted people. Gifted by you in so many amazing, incredible ways. And through that, God is as a conduit to, to joy and, and strength and intimacy with you. Forgive us, God, for making those gifts primarily about our advantage, about our experience, about our purpose. Forgive us, God, for fixating so much on the gift that we forget you who are the giver. Forgive us for relegating you to second place. May we honor you above all gifts. May we prioritize the way of love above all of them and all things. Love for you, God, and love for each other. We gather together, God, arguably, as isolated individuals, separate. When you call us to fellowship, community, and with an eye towards each other, teach us, God, how to put each other first, how to bless each other. Teach us, God, when to speak and when to remain silent. Teach us, God, how to defer and honor others where you are working too. Forgive us, God, for all the ways that we mess this up. And give your body a black eye or a bad reputation. Wash us today, Holy Spirit. Wash over us 
and cleanse us from sin and selfishness, from self-centeredness and self-glorification. Reroot us, God, to our purpose and meaning being to honor and glorify you here today. Lord, we ask this. Amen. Here's a picture of what the early church experienced and strove for. Let's make it our picture as well. 
Pray with me. Lord, devote us to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prepare and to prayer. Fill us with awe at the wonders and miraculous signs done by the apostles. Bring us together in common. May we sell our possessions and goods to help those in need. We will continue to meet, breaking bread in our homes and eating together with glad and sincere hearts. Receive our praise, O God. May we enjoy the favor of all the people. Add to our number daily those who are being saved. And may the God who has forged and fostered you into his body may show you his way. May he reveal his glory and presence to you. May he tune your heart to worship and service of him and the betterment of each other. May you know the grace of God and the presence of the Spirit in it. May he bless you, keep you, and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God Almighty in heaven look upon you with all favor and may he give you and fill you with peace. May that be the way. God bless. We all agree that that message was a, was a mirror. <laughs> Thanks for showing us reality, Dave. And uh, two things that I got from the service today. One, I got four kisses. So I think we should keep that practice in if my wife will allow. The other thing I think you're advocating for is FOF bedpans to reduce trips to the bathroom. Just saying. Let's see. I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the winds that you try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. I can feel the
Megan. Hi. My son Ben is leaving soon for graduation. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. So we're gonna. I gotta get rid of my gum. Hang on. <laughs> Gum. Stupid things like that. I always kind of forget about it, and then I'm like chomping away. So sorry, guys. This light is credible, too. Woo! There we go. Great service. Great service. Oh, yeah. Woo! I like, I'm just processing it. Like, there's just so much that I have to think about. Did I, I'm sorry. Let me back up a step. Ben is going to graduation. This is my daughter, Reagan. Yes. I don't know if I actually said that. Yes. I did. Okay. So it's said now. Great service. Yeah. Dave has such a way, Dad. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know how to talk about this now. He has such a way of talking about things in a disarming manner that says, "All right, let's see what really the issue is." And mm. let me say, as a wife, that is infuriating. <laughs> when I want to be mad, I want to be mad, and I'm not mad very often. But when I'm mad, I want to be mad, and he just disarms. It's frustrating. Well, yeah, and this is such a topic where, like, even just the mention of it is so oh. infuriating and just. It's, when he, it's I crazy. You, I don't know if you guys experienced this at home, but when he read that passage and the, he gets done, the entire sanctuary was silent. I mean, it was like silent and you can feel like this. I don't know if you get across the way, but I could yeah. feel like this, this tension. tension of like, all right, where are you going with this? Mm -hmm. This is a really interesting topic for me because now that I'm in college, I have a lot of female friends that are wanting to go on to seminary and become an ordained pastor. And you know, growing up in the LCMS church, that's, that doesn't happen, that's not a thing. So I've really had to wrestle with this myself, like understanding, okay, what does the Bible say? What do I believe? How, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Just navigating that. Yeah. Did you know I grew up in a church that greets each other with a holy kiss? Like, like literally like lips. on the lips? <laughs> That's funny. It is. And and so branch of the Mennonites, cousins to Mennonites, something like that. Anyway, men and women sit on opposite sides of the church and you greet each other. With men and men and women and women. They don't cross gender. Mm. But it's just a little, on the, like just a little peck like that. Hmm. Don't they do that in France? Or it's is that on the cheek, 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 cheek. Yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious though. Like greet each other with the holy kiss. Everybody's like, uh. I was sitting next to my sister Riley and I just like went in and I'm like mmm, 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 smoochy and she, she was not having it. Oh, Riley's not touchy feely no. at all. <laughs> oh. um, before we get too far, um, I want to let you guys, just a reminder that next Sunday is no nine o'clock service. No, no nine o'clock Bible study or rock or boulder, mm -hmm. but yes to 10 o'clock service. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's Sunday. The following Sunday is Pentecost, mm -hmm. which is going to be awesome. Huge thing. Huge deal. And Andrew and Steve, Dave's kind of, you forgot like Palm Sunday, and that's our big one. And Steve's like, no, 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 Easter has to be bigger. So let's, okay. And now they're like, and now it's Pentecost. And they just kind of like keep upping the ante. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if you guys watched or were at the Pentecost service last year, but it was hmm, absolutely crazy. It's when... Um, Pastor Dave had the <laughs> baptismal fonts up there, and he just invited anyone who wants to get that baptized. Was, that, was, that was Pentecost last year. And, and literally like for like an hour. Literally like an long. hour. No, it was that long of people just going up there, and it was so powerful. The Holy that. Spirit was just moving so much. So I'm really excited to see. I don't know if he's going to do that, but I heard something about pyrotechnics are too expensive, so they found something else. But they were literally considering pyrotechnics. Like, <laughs> fire, fuego. <laughs> Okay, so those, that's the next two Sundays. Um, Monday is softball at 6.30. Mm. I didn't get to go to last week's game because I was out of town, but I heard that it was fun. We need some more cheerleaders. Cheerleaders are fun. And then we might go out for dinner afterwards. <gasps> Always fun. Because it's at 6.30, done at 7.30. Yeah, head up to the Rusty Nail. Um, and then Wednesday is back to regular like Bible study, dinner at 5, study at 6. Yeah. And they've got like kid stuff. Good. All right, so... Oh, oh, and then um, like and share if you haven't, and mm -hmm. text here to that number if you haven't. Um, if you want to give, fantastic. The give by text is 815-201-1499. Brianna, woohoo, she's on it. And Brianna played softball last week. <gasps> Fun. Um, and then the, the other thing that I want to mention, just because this topic, I'm, I was somewhat familiar with it already, like the, the punchline to... So I, I kind of have some processing time, but if this is new to you and you have questions, um, Dave and Steve and Andrew, they do a podcast every Wednesday from 1230 to 130. 
questions you never thought you could ask in church. Mm -hmm. um, phenomenal place to ask your questions, and you can text your questions to. Do you have it online? Yay! Eight. Did you hear? On the screen, 815-314-0363, which is zero FOF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely, like you were saying, such an intense topic. So if you have more questions or want to dive deeper into this, please reach out to someone. And I got to tell you, as a woman, I kind of get riled up by Paul because he does say some stuff like this. I don't know, everybody in the booth right now is all women. Mm -hmm. hey. But uh, And so kind of get riled up and kind of have some like righteous anger like Ugh. and then when Dave explains it this way and that kind of takes the wind out of my sail I'm kind of like oh I, I'm not allowed to be upset about it <laughs> I mean it's it's okay to be upset it's just not okay to sit in that and sulk in it and let it yeah. burn yeah yeah hmm. I wrote a bunch of stuff down what else did I write down uh, when we gather the purpose is to worship God not ourselves mm. Ooh. I think everybody knows that, but reality, I think we forget a lot. You know, and it's easy because you come to church, you go to a church because you like that church, you connect with the people, you connect with the style, and, and really you walk away like, oh, that was great for me. Mm -hmm. and, and you just got to shift our, like, it's not about me. You know, so many people are like, oh, I'm not going to come because I don't feel like it. Well, it's not about what you feel like. Or, or there's a person there I don't want to see or talk to. Mm -hmm. And... It can be hard sometimes. It's because very difficult. Just because you're in the church doesn't mean you're not outside of the world. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a reality. Yeah. And it can be difficult. Um, but it's good to gather together. Yeah. And, oh, oh, here's where I was going. My, br my brain just kind of stopped. But so many times in the Bible, the Bible is full of opposites. How oh, yeah. Can it, how can it be grace and mercy? Because those are like, you know, how can God be just and merciful? Those are like opposites. Um, there's so many times in the Bible where it says stuff like, well, Jesus, you need to pick up your cross and carry me. You know, you're going to die, and that's where you find your life. Yeah. Like, how, how is that even possible? Doesn't well, make any sense. You give of yourself, but you find yourself. Isaiah, throughout the book of Isaiah, all the time, give of yourself, give up of yourself to serve others, and then you find yourself. And so many times it is, and, and I've experienced this too. I'm going to give up what I want in order to serve somebody else, whether that's my husband or my kids or my family or my church. And then all of a sudden you find yourself getting the very thing that you wanted that you thought you were giving up. Yeah. But because you've gone and honored God that way, like it comes back to you. It's God is sneaky that way. Mm -hmm. He just, yeah. And I think it's important too. It, it's really easy, at least for me, to get in the mindset of, oh, well, if I serve, if I sacrifice this of myself, then I expect something in return. I expect mm. to yeah. find myself in that. And that absolutely can be a gift that God gives us. And often is a gift. And often is, but that shouldn't be our motivation for sacrifice and for yeah. serving. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. What else do we have? Let me flip through my notes. I have one year left of college. Very Woo! exciting. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> um, you haven't really been here too much because mm -hmm. you've been in college. Yeah. There's been an issue with the kids before. I hope none of the parents were upset about that or wrongly upset. I don't know. So when, when oh. Dave was showing me over the weekends, like, can I put the slide up of like the, the verse about the women and then, then, can I, then he asks, can I go to this next slide about children should not use the bathroom? And, you know, I'm like, it's funny because they have a history of that. Mm. It's funny. So something that I want you guys to think about earlier before the service, a few of us were going around asking people how they've seen the Holy Spirit move in the past year or so. And it could be a quick 30 second answer or it could just be something you mull over and really think about. But that's really something that I encourage you guys to think about as we're leading into Pentecost is just how you've seen the Holy Spirit moving. Who, Whether was, who was doing that? Andrew and Pastor Dave. Dad. Like, were, were they videoing them or just like writing down answers? Yeah, videoing. Oh, which means in two weeks we're going to have an awesome video. Oh, I'm yeah. excited. Cool. Did they talk to you about that? Um, Did they ask you? They No, they, they asked me to like help ask questions. Okay. So I probably won't be in the video. You won't be the asker. You were the asker, not the asky. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you what, as much as we don't come to church to fill ourselves, 
this church does so many stuff that I'm like, I'm so excited. I can't wait for that for myself. Mm. Big shout out to Andrew because every single video that's played is literally phenomenal. I'm like so impressed. I'm a digital marketing major, so I kind of dabble in that videography world and I'm like, I want to do that. I want to be like that. So shout out to Andrew. He was playing the drums today. Andrew, Andrew's just like a master of all things. Yeah. Except for being around people. He doesn't like being around people. No. <laughs> Anyway, hey, I think we're going to wrap it up because I want to get to graduation. Yes. And you guys have a beautiful day to enjoy. Um, so seriously, text your questions in if you have them. Reach out to me if you have questions. And uh, have a great day, guys. Glad that we were able to worship with you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>